Okay, perfect. So, um, first off, why are we going through the shift book? And the reason is is that Gary and the entire uh, maps or the entire uh, top 100, um, there, what we're starting to see across the country, especially on the coast in particular areas, is the markets are starting to soften. And so I have coaching clients in California and Florida who have already shared with me that they're noticing um, more days on market, more inventory. Uh, I had one coaching client, for example, who shared with me that in one building where he was going to uh, uh, list a condo, there was actually 24 months of inventory already in that uh, condo building. So what I wanted to share with you here is – what are some of the signs of a shift? What are some of the things that you could be looking for so that uh, you can see if it starts happening in your area? Because for some of you, the shift may not happen for another year, yet we want to get ahead of this thing and start behaving right now as if the shift is already here. Uh, I had this conversation with a coaching client this morning, and she said, you know, in our market, we're not really feeling a shift. And I said, well, what's the downside to pretending like what one is coming? I mean, what's the downside of that? You're going to get your mind right. You're going to remarginalize your business. You're going to uh, start focusing on lead generation and lead conversion. You really have nothing to lose by pretending that a shift is coming, even if you can't see it right now. Now, some of the things to be looking for as far as if a shift is going to, is starting to occur in your area uh, number one is months of inventory. So I'm going to walk you through a uh, formula today that you can use to factor the months of inventory for any area, whether that's your entire MLS, a subdivision, a farm you work. So we'll walk through that today so that you can start using that in your buyer and listing presentation. Another one is increased days on market. So things are sitting on the market a little bit longer. Decreased showings. So if you know, towards the beginning of the year, for example, I have several coaching clients in Dallas and Seattle. Those are two of the hottest markets in the country right now where the, the challenge that they're having is really that there's very, very little inventory. And so if we start to notice that showings are, are creeping down and it's not just because of the seasonality, um, that could be a real telltale sign of a shift. Now, some shifts can occur because of uh, you know, an economic reason. So, for example, uh, there is one town up in Alaska that was a heavy oil town, and uh, the major employer there up and moved their entire uh, operation into a different state, and overnight the inventory in that neighborhood or in that city quadrupled because I don't remember what the percentage was. It was around, uh, I think, 25% of that city's population was employed directly or indirectly by that uh, company. So think about that. If you have, you know, in your area, one major employer, like that's how it is here in Wichita, we are a the aircraft capital of the world. And a few years ago when Boeing left, all the people who had um, who had houses under contract who worked with Boeing the majority of those ended up moving to Seattle, and those contracts went away. And there was about two or three months that it really hit us hard. So when we're talking about what could cause a shift or some symptoms of a shift, you know, pay attention to your local industry. And that really, that whole idea of becoming a local economist of choice isn't just reporting statistics. It's also knowing what are the things that are driving those statistics. And... If you know that, then if a shift is coming because of an economic reason, you can get ahead of it by developing relationships, whether it's with the owners, the HR directors of those companies, um, and start to become the, uh, the agent who actually lists the properties of all the people that are going to be moving in or out uh, of the city uh, thanks to that industry. Now, in the forward here, I'm on the uh, – uh, the first page of the forward, and I'm not going to just like go page by page here. So uh, what I encourage you to do actually is to read from the forward to tactic number two. And tactic number two we're going to cover next month, 
Uh, but go ahead and read this chapter if you haven't already and do it with a highlighter and ask yourself some questions. And I'll ask you some today just to help you kind of uh, work through this material here. Another thing that's really, really helpful with this is um, if you go to KWU Connect and sh uh, search for shift, then they have a uh, a class that they take all 12 tactics and break them out, and they have workbooks, they have uh, the graphs, they have everything that you would need to really internalize and immerse yourself in this material. And what I'd encourage you to do is take one tactic a month, just like what we're doing, go out, download that workbook, and there's exercises, questions, things that you could be doing right now to help you prepare for this because the shift could be the best thing that ever happened to you. And if you haven't been selling real estate, if you've been selling real estate less than four or five years, then you've never experienced the shift unless you're in a market like that one in Alaska uh, where it was a shift generated by, you know, economic or employment reasons. So I strongly encourage you to go out and each month find those manuals, print them off, and go through that. And if you have a team, I would suggest doing that with your team. For example, I have a coaching client who um, a few months ago we were noticing that a couple of his transactions were falling apart. So we said, okay, let's go through, I think it's tactic number nine and how to bulletproof the transactions. And don't you just do it. Have your whole entire team go through it. And uh, from that, they were able to really provide some great insights and get some good systems to prevent that from happening in the future. What we want to be here in regards to the shift is proactive, not reactive, because from this moment forward, not one person on this call can ever say that they didn't know it was coming. And what Gary talked about is that we want to be behaving like we are in the market that is coming, not the market we're in right now. So. In the forward here, a couple of things that I highlighted were that we repeatedly hear someone say that success isn't easy and quickly nod our heads in agreement. But I must say that I'm not so sure that it's hard either. I actually view it in a more practical and straightforward way that sidesteps the very concept of hard or easy. I think of success as simply the end result of a challenge accepted and achieved. Do you, now, do you have when shift? I had, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I didn't know I was. I was muted. Okay, hit star six, and uh, you'll mute yourself up. Um, now, in regards to success, I had the opportunity a few years ago to actually interview Gary Keller one on one, and it took me about six months to finally get him to agree to do that. And I was actually using a lot of the tactics from Shift to get him to agree to that uh, to that conversation. And one of the questions I asked him is I said, Gary, how do you define success? And he said, success is easy. It's simple. Success is knowing what you want and getting it. And he said the challenge with most people is that they can't define what it is that they want. And the difference between me and most people out in the world is I have clearly defined in every area of my life what I want, and it's very specific and it's written down. And he said, I'm very clear about what success is in relationship to my health. I'm very clear with my what success is in relationship to my wife and my son. He said he even has it down to what success is with his dog. So the question that I have to you is that if the purpose of this is for you to become successful and success is knowing what you want and getting it, can you define what you want in all the key areas of your life? Do you have it specifically written down? Because if you don't know what you want, if you don't know what the outcome is, then your life is essentially a jigsaw puzzle that you're trying to put together and you don't have the picture that you're trying to create. And think of how hard that would be to put together like a 500-piece jigsaw puzzle if you don't have the picture of what you're putting together. It's really, really challenging. So I want to be very clear moving forward what success is and what it isn't. Success is knowing what you want and getting it, and in order to get what you want, you have to know what that is. So I'm going to challenge you, all of you, and I'll be talking about this on our calls 
Look at the different areas of your life. And I believe that there are seven areas that you need to define success in. The first one is your health. Now, health can be broken down really into two chunks, physical health and spiritual health. The second one is your emotions. Here's the thing. The quality of your life is the quality of the emotions you consistently experience. I'll say that one more time. The quality of your life is the quality of the emotions you consistently experience. If you have a lot of money in your bank account, but you're mad, frustrated, and angry all the time, How does your life compare to someone who may have a lot less money, yet they're full of joy, peace, and gratefulness? So that leads to another interesting question is how do you define wealth? Is wealth created through a dollar amount in a bank account? Is it how you feel consistently? So getting your definition of wealth, especially in a time of shift, is more important than ever. Now, the third thing is relationships, defining success in relationships. And, you know, when it comes to relationships, the most important relationship you can ever have is the one that you have with yourself. How you feel about yourself, how you define yourself is the strongest force in human nature. And then we also look at your personal relationships, maybe with your spouse, your kids, your friends, your family members your uh, business associates, or your clients. So be very clear about what a successful relationship is to you and start with you and then work your way out from most important to least important. Now, I'm not saying you have to write a whole, like, uh, you know, book about all this, but the clearer you can be about what successful relationships mean to you, the easier your, your brain will move towards it. There's a great book that I recommend everyone read, and it's called Psycho-Cybernetics. It's by Maxwell Maltz. And in that, he talks about how our brain is essentially a servo mechanism. And the easiest way to think about this is it's like a heat-seeking missile. So we choose the target based upon what we think about. And then our brain starts aligning our beliefs, our actions, and our activities towards hitting that target. It's like if you are in a submarine and you launch a missile at another submarine and that submarine is moving, that missile will continue to move until until eventually it hits the other submarine. Your brain is the same way. The challenge is, is that most people focus on what they don't want, and that activates the servo mechanism to then chase exactly what you don't want, and then, boom, it hits it, and you get more of it. So the Psycho-Cybernetics book is super important for you to understand, and I think if you will take the time to listen or read it, then you'll understand the importance of being very specific about your definitions of success in each of these areas. So number three is relationships. Number four is time. So what is success in relationship to time? What would you, what do you want to spend your time doing? Do you live to work or do you work to live? Some of you, it could be you're in the wrong industry, but this industry, because of the nature of it, it makes you miserable and you're just too afraid to admit that and go out and venture into something else. Now, number five is your mission career, or job, however you want to define it, we have to define what success is in that relationship to what you're here to do. So what's the mission, the career, or the job that you were put on this earth to complete? And that may not be real estate. Real estate may simply be a way to fund it. And I love what Gary says in the one thing when he talks about, you know, how much money do you really need? Well, you just need enough to fund your purpose. So if you know what your purpose is, now you have an idea of how much money you're ultimately going to need. And most people, if they really sat down and did the work, they'd figure out that they need a lot less money than they think. So we'll get into passive income and things like that down the road. Now, number six, this is finances. 
And if you haven't read the book, The Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey, do yourself a favor and order it because the last thing in the world that we want you to experience is being all hat and no cattle. And what I mean by that is I can promise you, like, I have this agent that I used to coach, and she's in my local market, and from the outside, she is super successful. She drives a Mercedes. She lives in one of the nicest neighborhoods in all of our towns. Her kids go to private schools. Uh, her husband, you know, like, they're just, they, they live this really elegant life, and most people look at her and think, man, she is just knocking it out of the park. And I thought that way, too, until she's sitting in my office telling me that if this one deal doesn't go through, she's not going to be able to make her mortgage payment. So we need to be very clear about finances. And the easiest and and best way that I have found is that if you'll define what that is for you, what success in financial terms is through the lens of it funding your purpose and then go out and get the total money makeover, that will provide you with the plan. It's the six baby steps that Dave has laid out that anybody can follow to financial freedom. And then the last thing, number seven, is contribution. I think that in uh, in business, if we're looking at, you know, uh, there are these points of uh, survival that uh, we get past. And for most families, most households, there's been studies on this, that once you're making about $75,000 a year, more money won't make you happier. Uh, Because you're past the point of survival at that point. You're not wondering how you're going to pay, you know, the bills or put food on the table or pay the mortgage. And then that that's when your life needs to become about what you can give, who you want to contribute to. And that real feeling of how you're going to get outside of yourself, what Gary talks about is this idea of strategic giving and how, you know, now instead of it just being think a million, earn a million, net a million, now it's give a million. So if you had a million dollars, who would you give it to and what would that do for you? And so we want to define success in terms of giving and contribution. Now, if we're looking at the way that most people live, and I'm on page, uh, well, it's about the fourth page uh, into the uh, forward here, and it's this conversation that Gary is having with his son. And his son, uh, Gary, uh, approaches him and asks him to do something, and his son said, I don't want to do that. And Gary's first, you know, uh, instinct was just to say something like, you know, I don't care if you don't want to do it. I didn't ask you if you wanted to do it. Instead, he used it as a teaching moment. So if you have this in front of you, then you can see the diagram I'm talking about where it's got the line, and in the middle of it, it's got the circle that says average. If you don't have it in front of you, just do me a favor here and draw a horizontal line from the left to the right of your paper. And on the left-hand side, uh, at the end of the line, write the words complete failure. And on the right-hand side, write the words, massive success. And then in the very middle, I'd like you to just draw a circle, and inside of that circle, write the word, average. Now, Gary uses this as a teaching moment with his son where he's basically articulating to him that if you're going to have a great life, that there are going to be things that you don't want to do, and yet you should do. They still have to be done. And if we look at this, there are, I don't know that we know of people that are complete failures or complete successes. We all kind of live on this uh, equilibrium or this graph here. And so what I would encourage you to do is, based on your current level of activity, based on your current level of thinking, you doing the things that you don't want to do but should do, where would you say you are right now? So just kind of put your finger on if you've got, you know, a complete failure to a complete success with average in the middle, where are you right now? Now, where you are on this model is all based upon your decisions. 
And at any given time, we're all making three decisions. And I believe that decision is the ultimate factor in how our lives turn out. And the three decisions we're making all the time are, what is it? What are we focusing on? Are you focusing on solutions? Are you focusing on problems? Are you focusing on lack? Are you focusing on opportunities? So first thing that your fo- your first decision you're making is what to focus on. The second decision you're making is what does it mean? So that's your interpretation of your focus. So you're either focusing on things that are you're either focusing on things that are completely uh, that are disempowering you or you're focusing on the opportunity. It's just like if we take two people and, for example, it's a couple and one decides to end the relationship, um, and let's say that she decides to leave, well, based on that, he could focus on the fact that, okay, well, because she left, I'm no good, I'm not worthy, blah, 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 or he could focus on the fact that, you know, thank God she left, now I have somebody or have room for somebody that's right for me. And then the last decision we're making all the time is what to do. So if you're not lead generating, it's because your focus is off. You're not focusing on what you should. You're creating a meaning like I'm bothering people or I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know if it'll work. And then lastly, from that meaning, your action, what action to take is dictated by those first two decisions. So if you can align these three decisions here and get yourself to do the things you should do instead of what you want to do, then you can start moving yourself down the scale here towards complete success. Now, the reason I share this with you is because a shift becomes the area of opportunity for those who are willing to do what others won't. I'll repeat that. A shift becomes the an era of opportunity for those who are willing to do what others won't. So remember I had uh, started this out by saying I'm going to ask you some really specific questions. Well, the first question I have for you, other than defining success, is what are you willing to do? And the key word being willing, that others aren't willing to do. What is it in your business that you're willing to do in the area of lead generation, or maybe it's customer, uh, maybe it's, you know, customer service that your competitors won't. Because in a shift, it may be just that one or two things, there's one or two things that you're willing to do that other people aren't that can make all the difference. So think about that. What are some things that maybe, you know, we all have these lists of shoulds. The things that, you know, you go through the week and you're thinking, I should do that, I should do this, and what that really leads to is a really shitty life. But what are the things that you're willing to do that other people aren't willing to do? Because if you focus on those things and you focus on them in a, in a sense that it gets you to follow through and do your should instead of what's comfortable or what you want, you move towards complete success. And it's also an opportunity to kind of innovate on your business a little bit and take a look around and think to yourself, well, what's a service? What's a what's something that, you know, we can offer that maybe no one else has ever offered before? Like, for example, I was uh, on a coaching call uh, the at 1030 my time this morning, and uh, the, the person I'm coaching, he's developing this just amazing Internet um, marketing system that's just super comprehensive, and uh, we were talking about messages and things that you can use to attract sellers through the Internet, and I said, well, what if it was like the dating game where, you know, the seller is essentially uh, putting their house out on the market for this, for it to date a buyer because his system is generating a lot of buyer leads, and yet we wanted to shift the focus and get more seller leads. I said, well, what if it was to where you play the dating game and the sellers go out, they fill out a form just like you would on a match.com or a dating website. You fill out a profile, and then we're going to take that profile and match it up with the profile of other buyers 
or with buyers to see if we could create a relationship between the buyers and sellers. See, that idea is taking an idea from another industry and implementing it into real estate. And it's something that most people are not willing to do. So when I get to this point, and I've taught shift, oh, I don't even know, probably 12 times, what I usually ask people to do is to list out the five companies that you are most loyal to. The five companies that you're most loyal to. And ask yourself, why do I do business with these companies? Like for me, I... I love Starbucks. I don't drink Starbucks a lot, but I like Starbucks. I think the coffee is good, and I like the fact that they uh, provide health insurance for their even their part-time people. I like the fact that no matter where I go in, a, in the world or in the country, it's pretty much the same. I know what to expect. And so when I started analyzing Starbucks, and I'm like, well, what is it that Starbucks does that I could take out of their model and apply it into real estate. And the thing that really blew up in my face is the customer journey map. And the customer journey map, and you should Google this, Starbucks customer journey map. It's a map of what happens from the second someone walks in their store until they check out, get their coffee, and leave. And they have thought through every point on that map. And I thought, wow, what could we do with this? Well, then we took the customer journey map and you apply it to your real estate profession. So from the initial contact with somebody, what's the customer journey map that you can use that will ultimately lead you to your result, which, you know, in most cases we're talking about lead generation, is an appointment. And so I encourage you to do this exercise where you go through and you say, okay, what are the top five companies that I really respect? What is it that I like about them? And what is it about their process that I can take and actually apply to the real estate business that my competitors aren't thinking about or aren't willing to do. So I really hope that you'll do that exercise because even if it's just one company that you love and you get one great idea that then you execute on, there's the key, you have to be able to execute on it, who knows? That could completely shift your business forever. So list out the five companies, what do you love about them, and how can you apply that to your career or to your business to do the things your competitors aren't willing to do. Now, if we're shifting focus here and we're actually going into the, uh, the first tactic, so if we're flipping ahead to uh, the first tactic, real quick before we do that, uh, I want to ask you, when was the last time you have gone in and reviewed the four models of the millionaire real estate agent? Or can you, if I were to quiz you on this, could you name the four models of the millionaire real estate agent? What are they? Well, here's the thing. As I came up with this little acronym that has always helped me to remember it, and if all of you, wherever you're sitting, just do me a favor, take your right finger, index finger, and touch your left elbow and think elbow, E-L-B-O. Now, we're going to drop the W here, but economic, lead generation, budget, organization. Those are the four models of the millionaire real estate agent, and they all ask and answer different questions, right? Now, back to the original conversation around, well, what could you do that would your competitors weren't willing to do? I've offered this idea to a few people, and no one has taken it, if you think about industries, what business doesn't need an economic lead generation budget and organization model? Every single business needs uh, a model that says, how many clients do we need to hit our financial goal? How are we going to go out and find those clients? Once we found the clients, how are we going to manage the money? And then once we have so many clients, how are we going to continue to grow and offer service by adding people? Every single business needs these four models, and I don't understand why agents aren't taking the millionaire real estate agent models and principles and strategies and teaching them to small business owners in your area. Why aren't you doing that? It works. If you own a, if you're a, uh, 
a personal trainer and own a gym, do you think that building a database and using a 33 touch for your gym would work for you to grow your business? Absolutely. So my in the conversation here that I'm, I'm taking this is that the MREA is not just a real estate book. It is a business book. And if you'll master those models and then start to teach it, because, you know, I had an agent ask me about two months ago, what would you do if you started your sales career all over? How would you approach it? And I said, well, easy. I'd be known as a startup agent. I would go to all the entrepreneurs in my area, and I would get into relationship with them, and I would start teaching them how to build a business through the four models and the millionaire real estate agent. That's how I would do it. And I'd say, look, I'll teach you all this stuff for free because I happen to work with the number one training organization in the world. So I'll teach all of this to you for free. All I'm going to ask in return is that if you or someone you know needs to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, that I'm the first call that you make. Can we make that agree? So if we're going back to you know, that question of what are you willing to do that your competitors aren't and you need a good kickstart, there you go. So if you're somebody who's passionate about teaching, about learning and helping other people grow, that is a system that will meet you on multiple levels. You can teach and grow your business at the same time. So what I want you to do, though, is to remember those four models because if you're stuck or you're looking for what's the next thing I need to be focused on, you can always go to those four models and put your finger on the one that you need the most help with. Most people, it's lead generation. Some people, it's budget. You know, they've got leads and they're converting leads, but they're making all this money and they're not accounting for it, so they don't know what their net income or their tax liability or any of that stuff is. So I would encourage you to be very familiar with those models. Get that somewhere that you look at it all the time because the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book is still as relevant, rev, rev, uh, relevant as today as it was when Gary wrote it. Now, if we're actually getting into the first tactic here and we're talking about shifts happen, and I'm on page seven, you guys live through a shift in the market every single year. Right now, sales-wise, you're in a peak. Um, in our market, because I did a three-year study on Wichita, I used to do this every year, um, sales, closed units always peak in July. And then it kind of dips down uh, in August. We have a slight uptick in September. And then around October 15th, October 31st is when you start getting those conversations about, I'm going to list or buy next year. And what's interesting about that is a lot of agents just tend to shut off and quit working. And every single year as an agent, my best month was December, every single year. Because even though I had to talk to twice as many people during that October to, you know, November, in the November time frame, there were half as many agents working. And I promise you, your market is the same way, unless you're in a snowbird market like in Arizona or in a you know, resort-type market. So yours may be a little different, but we all have seasonality. And most of the time, agents start saying things like, well, nothing sells in the winter, so it's just an excuse for them to stop working. Now, I'm all for you taking some time off and being with your family, you know, during the holidays, and yet it needs to be something that's pre-planned, and on work days, you're working. So, the purpose of that is to first know that you live through a shift every single year. The second thing is to show you that it doesn't matter what the market's doing. If you're doing the right activities, you will get results. doesn't mean you don't have to increase your activities. Instead of, you know, every 25 contacts you're getting an appointment, it may go to 50 contacts. But the goal is still the same. If you need two listings in that week, instead of 50 contacts, you got to make 100. And, you know, I, I, it's just like talking to agents and they're saying, well, I don't want to lead generate. Like, oh, I get that. I don't know of many, very many people that really like lead generating. Yet you want the result that lead generation will give to you. And if you want to get to that result, you have to pay the price. And part of paying the price is figuring out how to drive enough leads into your business. And it's just like someone saying, you know, I want to become a doctor. And in order to become a doctor, you have to go through medical school. And if you said, well, I don't like tests, 
well, that doesn't mean that you don't have to take tests in medical school to become a doctor. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it goes away. So my encouragement to you is to make peace with lead generation and do it knowing that no matter what the market is doing, you can still yield results if you're committed enough to not quit before you get the yes. And so what happens, though, just like in uh, a seasonal market, is that when the market slows down, you have less agents working. So available income in the market, total number of sales, and the number of agents in that market are directly related. So I don't know about your area. In our area, though, there's like floods of people getting into real estate right now because they hear the market's good and it's easy and blah, blah, blah. And when the market shifts and the available income goes down, a number of those agents are going to leave the industry. And not just those agents, they're going to take their little brokerages with them. So like these discount brokers, people that will, you know, do it for 1%, whatever, a lot of those uh, companies will not survive a shift. Like assist to sell was huge when I first got into real estate because the market was booming in like 2006. And in two years in our market, they were gone. And I don't think they've ever been back. I don't think we've ever seen them back. So um, when we're looking at the three different types of markets, and this is how I used to talk in during a listing presentation, is I would say, now, there are three different types of real estate markets. And what type of market we're in is all directly related to how much inventory we currently have on. So, for example, you may have heard that we're in a buyer's market right now. Do you know what that means and how we measure if we're in a buyer's market? And most people, they don't understand that. They don't know what that means. Say, so, okay, well, there are three types of markets. You have seller, balanced, and buyer. And a seller market, and it's right here in shift on page number nine, is zero to five months of inventory. That's a seller's market. Now, a balanced market is five to seven. Now, here's the thing about balanced markets is that we never really hang out in a balanced market very long. We're either on our way up to a buyer's market or we're on our way down to a seller's market. And then lastly, a buyer's market is seven plus. Now, there's different degrees of a seller's market. For example, if you're in a market that's in that has four and a half months of inventory, you're in a seller's market, it's just a little bit weaker than in a market that has maybe one month of inventory. So how do we figure months of inventory? Real simple. When I used to do listing presentations and let's say I had a house that uh, I was going out to talk with them about, I drew a one-mile circle on the MLS around their house. And I was looking for three numbers. So write these down. I needed actives. I needed under contracts or pendings. And I needed solds. And I always did a time period. So you could do three months, six months, whatever you want to use. In a seller's market, it's probably best to do three months. In a buyer's market, just because there are fewer sales, I'd recommend doing like six. Now, the first thing that we need to figure out is how many homes are selling each month. So how we do that is we take actives and add it to pending. So let's say that we're using, uh, in, in this example, we have uh, two active or I'm sorry, six active homes, and we have three under contract, so that's nine. And if we take that and we, I'm sorry, let me back up. It's sold plus pending, not active. My mistake, I screwed that up. So sold plus pending, so let's say we had six sold and three pending. That equals nine. Divide that by your time period. So if it's three months, then that means that there are three homes selling each month. So then we look at the actives, and let's say that there are 12 active homes in the area. Well, if we take those 12 and we divide it by the number of homes that are selling each month, we're going to come up with four. 
So in this example, in this area, there are four months of inventory. So that would mean that we're in a seller's market. And it's really important to do this by neighborhood so that your sellers can see and really use this information to help them influence themselves to take uh, or to price the home correctly. So if you're explaining to them, here are the different types of markets, here's how the market is trending, oftentimes when you're sitting there with somebody, if you've done your market analysis properly based on the market, whether it's shifting or not, you don't have to, like, you know, hard grind them on the on the price. Most of the time they'll self-discover what the price needs to be. You've given them all the information they need to make a great decision. Now, if we're moving forward here, and um, I am on, let's see, I'm on page number 24, and uh, we're going to go about another five minutes here, and I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, page 24 at the bottom, it says, you can't control the market, but you can control your outlook and your response to the market. And... Um, what this really means is that you can control your perspective. So if the market shifts, how you view that is going to be uh, the deciding factor of whether or not this will become an opportunity or a problem. And I'll tell you that more millionaires are made during times of recession or downturn than times of, you know, like what we're in right now. And it's important to look at what do top investors, people who are wealthy, what do they do when times are good? They're not out buying things. They're usually selling everything that they bought when times were bad. So your perspective on this is going to be everything. And if it's a big, hard challenge, then that's the way that you'll uh, approach it. And you may not survive a hard shift in the market. Now, the other thing here is this idea of shadow performance. And right now, for a number of you, your markets are so good that it is actually shadowing all the things that you're not doing or the things that you're doing incorrectly. So when a market shifts, what happens is now instead of a shadow on your performance, you've got a spotlight and all the things that were being, you know, uh, thrown aside, procrastinated on, like lead generation is usually the biggest one. Um, are now they have a spotlight on them and all those challenges, issues, whatever, they all rise to the surface. So you've got all these issues here. And the last thing that I'm going to recommend that you do, a piece of action that you can take from today's call to prepare for this, whether it comes or not, and I got this from Ben Kinney, is reserves, reserves, reserves. So I want to give you a quick, and this is straight out of the Total Money Makeover, but for those of you who haven't read it or won't read it, I want to give you a quick uh, couple-step action plan here of what you can do to prepare for the shift. So the first thing is you need to put aside an emergency fund. Now, most of the time that could be a 1000 or $2,000, but that money is there for when Murphy shows up. So Murphy is what can go wrong, will go wrong. We want to have some Murphy money set aside so that if something comes up, you don't reach for a credit card to fix that issue. And I'm not just talking about personally. I'm also talking about in your business. Now, the second thing is, is we need to look at how much debt do you have. List out all the debt you have except for your mortgage. So I'm talking about what are the balances that you owe on all the debt you have? Credit cards, cars, uh, student loans, uh, home equity line of credit I wouldn't really count as a mortgage. But we want to get all that onto one page and figure out how much debt are you carrying right now. And then we need to put together an action plan where you're taking money from your closings and paying that debt off. 75% of high, worth, high net worth individuals say that getting and staying out of debt is the best way to build financial freedom. Now, once you've paid your debt off, everything except for the mortgage, then you need to build a reserve. And we need two reserves. We need a reserve for you personally, 
So how much does it take for you to live it with your mortgage, food, gas, uh, fun, bills? How much does it take for you to live each month? So whatever that number is, we need six months of that. So let's say it's $7,000 for you and your family to live. We need $42,000 saved. And then we also want to look at your business and figure out how much does it take to run your business. If you don't have a closing, how much money goes out? What's your overhead? And let's say that that's four or $5,000. Let's just say five. Okay, so we need $42,000 in a personal reserve, and we need a $30,000 business reserve. So if you can pay your debt off, which will drastically decrease the amount of money going out each month, Instead of using this time right now to go out and buy things, you need to be investing and building for your future. And you do that by paying off your debt and getting reserves. Now, once you have the reserves, then we talk investment. How do we go out and start building passive income? And the goal there should be how much passive income do I need so that I have enough money coming in that I can pay for my living expenses. So if we go back to that $7,000 example, that person would need about $7,000 a month in passive income. And if you have that, you have no pressure because the money that's coming in passively is taking care of all your living expenses. Anything that comes in on top of that can be used for fun, you know, uh, travel, whatever it is that you want to spend your money on. So as it relates to shift and getting your mindset right, these are the things that I'm going to be encouraging all of you this month to be putting into action. And even if the shift never shows up, you'll be in much better, a much better position financially, especially financially, than you would have if we hadn't pretended that the shift was coming at all. So we have about nine minutes here. I want to open it up to see if there's anything that you have questions on, uh, maybe something I wasn't clear on. I did record the call, so I will be uh, uploading that and emailing it out to everybody by next Monday. If you have a question, go ahead and hit star six and feel free to file. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, Jordan, can you hear me? I can. I had a quick question um, just about when you, when you said um, down into a seller's market and up into a buyer's market. I'm just curious about that, you know, that characterization because I guess, you know, I've kind of always looked at it the opposite and, and as a shift uh, you, you know, going up in a seller's market, mostly relative to prices and then kind of heading down into a buyer's market. Oh, great question. So what I really mean by that, Anthony, is when we're going up to a buyer's market, we're strictly talking about months of inventory. Okay, gotcha. So as months of inventory goes up, we're going up into a buyer's market, or if inventory is coming down, we're going down into a seller's market. So great question, but that's what it means. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. Anybody else have a question before we jump off? Okay, we will be covering shift tactic number two next month. I will get you dates and times for that. Uh, we'll probably do it a little bit later in the afternoon so that the people on the West Coast aren't having their lead generation time interrupted. Thank you to everybody who attended today. I hope you got something out of it. Feel free to email me any questions or ahas, and I'll talk with all of you on your next coaching call. Thank you.